my name's Jack Rivers Audi. I did my PhD on cannabinoids, which are marijuana-like substances, and how they may affect neuroinflammation during stroke. So I'm gonna answer some questions for you today, and let's get straight into it. Okay, so the first question we got is, what is the difference between medicinal and non-medicinal marijuana? The short answer is there is no difference. They're both leafy material. However, pharmaceutical companies are getting involved and are trying to produce different ways of administering it that may improve the efficacy of marijuana-like drugs. Um, and so it involves this word that's called pharmacokinetics, which is a big word, but hopefully I can explain it with my handy-dandy whiteboard that's pre-prepared. So, ooh, here we go. You have effect on this y-axis and time on the x-axis. Now what you can imagine is, if the effects are low, you're not getting a medicinal effect from the marijuana. But if the effects are really high, you might start to get side effects. So what we have is what's called a pharmacologically active window. Where above this line, we're getting too many effects and we can end up with loads of side effects. And below this, we're not getting enough medicinal effects. Now the in inhalation of plant material marijuana has a very specific profile that looks something like this. It shoots right up, very high up straight through into the side effect area, which is strong cognitive effects on the brain. You might call it getting high. And then it slowly, it quickly descends and it comes down and it comes through out the other side as time goes on. So what you can see is the period of time that it's actually in this effective pharmacologically active window, which has reduced side effects, but a good response is very small. So what pharmaceutical companies are doing is they're developing under the tongue sprays or pills that slow the release of the drugs into your blood system. And what you end up with now is a trace that looks something a bit more like this. And so we get a much longer time in this pharmacologically active window. And so there's lots of research going into that right now. So the next question was, do you think there's a legitimate argument for the legalization of cannabis for medicinal use? This question relates heavily to the answer that I just gave about pharmacokinetics. And it's about whether drug companies can improve what's happening in nature. So opium is a drug and it was also made illegal because of its terrible side effects and its addictiveness. Um, but scientists didn't give up on the medicinal properties of opium. So what they did was they extracted the active ingredients and in fact designed their own that were very similar to the active ingredients of opium. And from that they created some of the most commonly used drugs today, such as morphine and codeine. I think marijuana has a very similar story to tell. We don't go out and smoke opium when we're in pain, so perhaps we shouldn't go out and smoke marijuana when we're in pain. Perhaps we should look to the pharmaceutical companies to produce drugs that maximize the um, positive effects of marijuana whilst minimizing the potential negative side effects. And then it could become part of an arsenal of drugs that a doctor may have available to treat certain things like pain and spasticity. Okay, so the next question was, can you overdose on cannabis and will smoking it lead to an addiction? So. Can you overdose on it? If we mean by having a negative response to it that may require hospitalization, you definitely can overdose on marijuana. The legalization of marijuana in Colorado resulted in a, a dramatic increase in the number of people hospitalized with uh, overdoses on marijuana. What they tend to experience is a short psychotic event um, or perhaps severe confusion, dehydration, a whole bunch of stuff that can possibly happen because of uh, overdosing on marijuana. Can you die from it? Well, you can die from overdosing on anything, but uh, as far as I'm aware, there have actually been no case studies of people overdosing on marijuana to the point that they die. So the next part of the question is, is marijuana addictive? This again is a bit of a tough question. Now, it's probably not addictive in this, in, in, on a similar level to opioids. You won't go through um, physical withdrawal that can cause uh, a severe risk to your health. Sometimes when people come off opioids, suddenly their system goes into shock and it can cause a severe health reaction. But that's not to say that marijuana isn't addictive. Computer games are addictive, gambling's addictive, alcohol's addictive, and it's all addictive through more of a, a behavioral response. But interestingly enough, animals seem to also be able to get addicted to marijuana-like substances. So there is a chemical element that's going on in the brain that does result in some sort of 
dependence on marijuana. And again, there, the treatments in Colorado following legalization, there was a, uh, an increase in enrollment in people who considered themselves dependent on marijuana and would like to get off it and required going through some sort of detox or rehabilitation system. Okay, so the next question, and it was a very common question, is should we legalize marijuana? So the first thing I would like to say is I'm a biologist and I'm a scientist and we should definitely be part of the discussion, but we shouldn't be the whole discussion. There should be political scientists, sociologists, there should be cultural leaders in the community talking about this. So the real question is what could a scientist bring to this discussion? And so there have been a lot of studies on this. So the first thing you might want to know when deciding whether to legalize it is, is does it cause harm? Does use of marijuana potentially cause health risks? And the answer is yes. Um, so there was a study of about 49,000 Swedes and they followed them throughout their life after they conscripted, in, conscripted into the army in 1970. And they followed these Swedes and in a self-reported survey, those who used marijuana more than 50 times previously, 50 separate occasions, had a 6.7 times chance of developing schizophrenia. So it was about 3.8 percent of those people develop schizophrenia compared to about 0.6. Now when you adjusted for smoking and IQ and socioeconomic status, that dropped down to about a threefold increase. Now that is a correlative study. Um, that's a similar study on those same group of people found that you had about a twofold increase in lung cancer. But again, that's a correlative study and it's very hard to do an, uh, an intervention study where you give some, you force some people to smoke marijuana and you force some people not to. Um, but it's certainly indicative, uh, indicative uh, that there might be some negative health side effects there. Um, the second thing you might want to know is will legalizing it increase its use? And the answer again is probably yes. So certain countries and certain states in America have legalized it and following legalization there has been a substantial increase into the number of hospital emissions caused by overdosing on marijuana or having a developed a dependence on marijuana and you would expect that overdose or dependence to be proportional to the number of people using it. Similarly when they legalized medicinal marijuana and you had to register for it, those registrations increased dramatically over time. As soon as you gave an avenue to smoke marijuana the usage will probably go up. So that is probably what the science would say on that. The next question is, is that grounds enough to make it illegal? And that is a really tough question. It should probably be better answered by other people. In my opinion, I would say this. What do we benefit from treating marijuana smokers like criminals? What do we benefit from treating people who are addicted to opium, people who are addicted to amphetamines? What do we benefit by treating these people like criminals? And in fact, what do we benefit from treating criminals like criminals? The system uh, may not be working very well. You're getting a third of criminals released in the UK reoffend within 12 months. The prison system is probably not the best place to rehabilitate people who have used drugs, who are looking to get off drugs. So making it a criminal activity to use drugs or be dependent on an addictive substance in any way doesn't seem to me to benefit society. But that is my opinion and that's not really science, but that's my answer to the question. So the next question was, what are the medical applications of marijuana? This is sort of a good introductory question to it. So marijuana has a number of effects on the body. One effect is that it seems to suppress the immune system, um, which can be great if you have an over-responding immune system or you have inflammation. Another one is it does uh, very complicated things to your brain. Um, it's one of the most common G protein, it is the most common G protein coupled receptor in your brain, which is a, a kind of receptor, and it's expressed on almost every neuron in the brain, the receptor that the marijuana substance binds to and activates. Um, but looking at the basic research, you would think marijuana does a lot. So when you look at mouse studies and cell studies, you would think that marijuana can almost cure any disease. But the real question is, is what has been translated into clinical trials? So they've done a lot of clinical trials and these have recently been reviewed in an excellent paper. And the conclusion of this paper was essentially that the study design has been relatively poor. Um, they haven't had the proper placebo controls. They haven't been comparing to the current best treatment available. So an example might be marijuana supposedly reduce pain by binding to those receptors in the brain. 
Um, and there are some studies that show that smoking marijuana does reduce your experience of pain. Um, however, when you compare that to the current treatment such as codeine, which is an over-the-counter pain relief, the, the study seems to break down and they found no difference between codeine and marijuana in terms of pain relief. Um, and it becomes complicated because there's what's called the placebo effect. If you think you're getting a treatment, you tend to feel better. And so with these kinds of responses like vomiting, which is another thing marijuana has been prescribed for, spasticity and pain, there may be a real placebo effect going on. So how do you control for that? Well, you give half the people a placebo, which is doesn't have any marijuana substance in it. And then you give the other half of the people a pill which does contain the marijuana substance. And you compare between these people. But there's a problem. The people in the marijuana groups will experience the effects of marijuana. They will know that they have taken a marijuana pill. Whereas the people in the placebo group may not experience that. So there's this immediate unblinding. Suddenly they go, oh stink, I didn't get the treatment in the placebo control group. And oh yay, I got the marijuana treatment group in the marijuana treatment. I got the, I got the treatment in the marijuana treatment group. And so then just by um, internal experience they might see that there is a drop in pain or a drop in nausea. So they're very hard studies to do on marijuana and the evidence is it's pretty average at the moment. Um, but it seems to be that when you look at it in general scientific consensus, there should be a pain relieving response, maybe a reduction in spasticity with things like multiple sclerosis, and perhaps um, a reduction in vomiting, and an increase in diet, which can be really important for people who are already currently on a treatment that may reduce your diet and um, cause vomiting, such as chemotherapy. Um, so there are potential effects and but we need to do a lot more research so please let's get out there scientists and uh, really put in some high quality uh, clinical trials for this. Having said that you'll also be pleased to know that if you're coming to Manchester you are uh, much better off than if you were to move to study in Miami or New York or Tokyo or Singapore or Hong Kong or Milan, uh, Bergen, Zurich and many other places around the world who actually have a higher annual precipitation record than Manchester uh, itself.